All right, so hello and welcome back. So the audio was a little bad. Uh, that's my fault on last video. I don't know why it keeps resetting it on G Logitech uh, G Hub for my Blue Yeti. I don't know why I have to <laughs> legitimately click the thing over and over again for it to be less deafening. <laughs> but there it is. So hopefully you still like part one, but we're here at part two. So we will continue. Thank you for your watching. Thank you to my patrons and the original videos in the description. So let's get off with this on. On the 14th, I will be emperor or I will be dead. Grand Duke uh, Nicholas XII. Uh, 12th of December, 1825. <laughs> In 1825, Pavel Pestel learned that the following spring, Emperor Alexander and his entourage would travel to Ukraine to inspect troops of the Second Army. Pestel formed a plan to assassinate the Emperor and launch a coup to establish a Russian Republic. The date was set, the 12th of March, 1826. After urgent communications with the Northern Society, Ryliev's faction agreed to launch a simultaneous uprising in the capital, St. Petersburg. But in December, Unexpected news threw all their plans into disarray. That winter, Emperor Alexander visited southern Russia, where it was hoped the climate would improve his wife's frail health. Instead, Alexander himself became seriously ill. He died at Taganrog, aged 47. Typhus was the most likely cause. Wow, he died real young. Yeah, I was going to throw all your plans out. The operation is go, 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 go. Yeah, th this is uh, this is go time. Alexander's sudden death was a shock to all Russia. The Decemberists had agreed that the best time to force political change was at the succession of a new Tsar. Now was their moment. But no one was quite sure who the new Tsar was. Alexander had died without legitimate offspring. By the law of succession, he should have been succeeded by the eldest of his younger brothers, Grand Duke Constantine. But Constantine was terrified at the prospect of becoming emperor. I will be strangled, just as my father was strangled, he would say when the subject came up. So three years before his death, Alexander signed a secret document making his younger brother Grand Duke Nicholas his heir. But when Alexander suddenly died, the new order of succession was still secret, known only to a few members of the imperial family. And that can make this thing real messy. Because we have Emperor Paul, the Fr uh, Paul up there, right? He was strangled. So his duke, uh, Grand Duke Constantine, didn't want it, obviously. He's like, I don't want to be strangled. And uh, Alexander died. So by succession rights, it should go to Constantine. If he didn't have it, then it would go to Grand Duke Nicholas. But it's a secret agreement, it's only written by a few people, so it's like not going to be supported by the entire arist uh, aristocracy. But it depends if you need their support. You don't really need it if you have an absolute monarchy, which you do. Um, and you have Grand Duke Michael also. And he might try to buy for the throne be like, no, if he didn't have it, then it went to me. So this could start a power struggle. All of Russia assumed Constantine was their new emperor. Patriarchs, politicians, and troops swore new oaths of loyalty. Even Grand Duke Nicholas swore an oath, judging it better to observe the usual customs until Alexander's secret document could be made public. But Constantine, based in Warsaw in his role as commander-in-chief of the Polish army, had no intention of taking the throne. Nicholas urged his brother to come to St. Petersburg and publicly renounce the throne to end the confusion. Constantine refused. I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. What? What? Okay, I cannot accept your request to come to St. Petersburg and, war and warn you that I shall move even further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. The will of your late sovereign is... Nicholas takes the throne, and you are bypassed. But everyone thinks it's you, so unless you say something, it is going to be you. Oh, this is going to be a shit show. 
further away unless everything is settled in accordance with the will of our late sovereign. Meanwhile, the Decembrists in St. Petersburg were meeting daily. They had been caught off guard by Alexander's death, but the chaos of the Interregnum provides perfect cover for them. They recruit more officers to their cause, sound out the rank and file, work out who can be relied on and who cannot. Relief works without pause. All are fired with a wild enthusiasm. That December, rumors, confusion and fake news swirl around the Russian capital. Grand Duke Nicholas knows he is not popular with the troops. They regard him as another martinet, overly fond of inspections and parades. I don't need to tell you why that's retarded. <laughs> Literally retarded. Oh, I will dress on my uniform, get my tie, I gotta stand out in this damn formation, pick up the gun, stand here, stand at attention for 18 hours, while that prick over there comes and inspects me. Yeah, you can see why people don't like him. Now he is told that unknown army officers are actively conspiring against him. He decides to act first. In the early hours of the 14th of December, 1825, Nicholas declares himself Emperor of Russia. He will require an oath of loyalty that morning from all officials and troops in St. Petersburg. The Decembrists know that if the troops swear that oath, their cause is lost. There might not be another opportunity like this in decades. Go, 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 go! The 14th of December becomes do or die for the revolutionaries. And before the day is out, the streets of the Russian capital will run with blood. 14th December, 1825, St. Petersburg. The Decembrists' Northern Society has its headquarters at the offices of the Russian American Company, where one of its key members... Russian American Company, wonder where they got their ideas for the Constitution from. Oh, huh, I wonder where. Relief is a major shareholder. Decembrist leaders have been working feverishly day and night to put everything in place for a coup. Relief is the chief organizer, despite being unwell. Before dawn, they learn that the new emperor has ordered all troops and officials in the capital to swear an oath of loyalty to him that morning. They must act immediately. Once the troops swear the oath, it will be too late. Most Decembrists are officers in the lifeguards regiments, stationed in St. Petersburg. They plan to tell their men that Nicholas, known and disliked by the troops, is usurping the throne from his brother Constantine. You can see why I said Constantine is going to be, is going to cause a clusterfuck. And this is why. <laughs> to whom the soldiers swore an oath of loyalty just 17 days ago. There is no plan to involve the Russian people in their revolt. These young aristocrats fear that this would only lead to the bloody chaos of the French Revolution. Instead, they will rely on their social connections and the unquestioning trust of the men under their command. They will then use these troops to seize control of the capital, the emperor, and the government. They will form three groups. The first will be led by Captain Alexander Yakubovich, a distinguished veteran of the Caucasus War with a reputation for courage. His men will seize the Winter Palace and secure Emperor Nicholas and his family. Some Decembrists want to keep the Emperor prisoner, but Rileyev secretly entrusts his assassination to 28-year-old Pyotr Kachowski, an officer recently retired due to ill health. As a cadet officer in the lifeguards Jaeger regiment, Kachowski had been demoted for rudeness, debt and laziness. He is a loner without friends or money, but dedicated to the cause of liberty, and imagines himself a slayer of tyrants. A second detachment... <laughs> Remember, the Winter Palace is going to be actually it's very important throughout Russian history. You have Peter the Peter I, Catherine the Great, usually everyone has used it. A lot of people, a lot of stars have been removed there. Um, and 
star is hard. Nicholas II won't be any different. Um, the actually no, it won't be. I think his wife was there. Yeah, <clears throat> but he had this plan. Seems a lot like Operation Valkyrie. Like, ah, you know, we gotta take the heads, and we gotta take all the loyal officers. We gotta take the head of the government out. We gotta take the loyal officers out, and then we gotta stage everything. It seems a lot like Valkyrie. Regiment will be commanded by 32-year-old Colonel Alexander Bulatov, a hero of the Napoleonic Wars and Relief's childhood friend. He's recruited just a few days before the revolt, as the Decembrists seek to involve more senior officers. His unit will seize the Peter and Paul Fortress, which contains the city's arsenal and dominates the city center. Which is good. If you have that, you can start handing out arms to the people that are definitely not recruited in this because they saw the what happened in the French Revolution, so they decided not to do that, which will probably come to bite them in the ass. But it still does command a commanding position in case there's a long protracted fight or they need more ammo or anything. This is where the ammo is in the city. Colonel Prince Sergei Trubetskoy has been appointed dictator or leader of the coup. He is another officer of proven courage from a distinguished family. He will command the main force, expected to number nearly 10,000 men, which will assemble in Senate Square. Trubitskoy will then enter the Russian Senate and demand that it issues the Decembrists' manifesto to the Russian people. The document announces the establishment of a new provisional government until elections can be held. The freedom of the press and of worship, equality before the law, the introduction of jury trials, and the abolition of serfdom and military settlements. Which the bottom point was to have everyone just like that could possibly do it. And they're actually going to deliver it to the Russian Senate. Now, I don't think I mentioned this, but technically they exist. There was, let's back up here. There was a semi-informal kind of uh, system of governance going on in Russia. I'm, I'm digging very far back in my brain now. But for all intents and purposes, it acted like this. There is a person that was to oversee a region, or a, like just a settlement, let's just say that, and they were given some special monies um, by the Senate, which had to be approved by Alexander, and so in reality, they basically had absolutely no power at all to do anything, but that was, if I remember correctly, at least a local representative, or kind of, they weren't ever voted on, and they were just appointed, but you get the idea there, um, where they were talking about, and then the Senate, you know, senators that supposedly vote on things, again, it's just, um, again, complete absolute monarchy so you can see that uh when it's like that I mean, the, these institutions exist for you know oh they exist so we can't be you know an absolute monarchy but in reality they are and military settlements two well-known and respected politicians nikolai mordvinov and mikhail speransky would lead the new government to provide continuity and reassurance If I am to be emperor for only one hour, I shall show myself worthy of being so. Emperor Nicholas, the 14th of December, 1825. Here we go. The Decembrists, drawing on their military experience, have come up with a realistic plan to seize control of the Russian capital. But almost immediately, the conspiracy begins to unravel. On a bitterly cold morning, Kakovsky and Yakubovich come to Rileyev's apartments where the Decembrists have been meeting. Kakovsky has lost his nerve and is no longer willing to kill the Emperor. At the last minute, Yakubovich has also decided he cannot shed the blood of Russian soldiers and refuses to lead troops against the Winter Palace. Bulatov, who is supposed to lead his troops against the Peter and Paul fortress, does not even show up. Uh, all right. Nope. Call it off. Call it off. It ain't. It, it, it's already over before it started. That that all that right there. That means this has failed before it even got off the ground. The 
the Decemberists are in a race against time. There are several guards regiments. Wow, there are a lot of lifeguard regiments. My god. All right, we got the Jaegers lifeguard regiment, which means hunter. So guys will wear green jackets and fight in the forest. We got Moscow lifeguards. Okay, that makes sense. You know Moscow. <clears throat> Simonov's lifeguard. I'm not sure. Simonov's lifeguard. Not sure. Lifeguard horse regiment makes sense. Uh, horse cavalry. You got Finnish lifeguards. So the Finns that are defending uh, the Tsar. You got lifeguard grenadier regiment. Makes sense because of grenadiers. You got Pavlovsky's lifeguard regiment. You got Pavlovsky's lifeguard regiment. <laughs> so all again named after people. Okay. And since in Petersburg, they must win over enough of them to secure the capital before the regime understands what's going on. And you must understand, these are the only regiments in the city because they're all lifeguards. They should, in theory, be loyal absolutely to the Tsar and no one else. But that's a lot of regiments for lifeguards. I don't know why there's so many. Usually there's like one or two for obvious reasons. And moves against them. But they learn that the Senate and Priobrzezhensky lifeguards have already sworn the oath of loyalty to Nicholas. This painting was based on sketches made later by the Emperor himself. It shows the Priobrzezhensky lifeguards' first battalion arriving at the Winter Palace that morning. It's an act of loyalty for which Nicholas will always be grateful. All right, so it's nine o'clock now, and we have one regiment that has sworn loyalty to the Emperor, so they're his one unit that he has, and everyone else is still up in the air. Battalion of the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment comes over to the Decembrists' cause, thanks to the efforts of Captains Shepin Rostovsky, Mikhail Bestuzhev, and his brother Alexander Bestuzhev. But the regime is moving much faster than expected. Officers loyal to Nicholas, now aware of the unfolding coup, arrange for the Ismailovsky, Semyonovsky, and Pavlovsky lifeguards regiments, and the lifeguards horse regiment to swear the oath to Nicholas. Yep, okay, so now we have one, two, three, four, five on the um, Emperor's side, and they're also near the Winter Palace, like the Pavlovsky lifeguard regiment is. So they have these two up here, um, these two regiments up here, and you got lifeguards, so he's in, at least in a semi-decent position right now. 700 men of the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment leave their barracks and march through the icy streets to Senate Square. Their rallying cry is, for Constantine and Constitution. The men of the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment take position in Senate Square, near the famous bronze statue of Peter the Great. They are joined by several Decembrist leaders, including Rilev and Kachovsky. Captain Alexander Bestuzhev ostentatiously sharpens his sabre on the base of the statue. Officers and men look resplendent in full dress uniform. But Trubitskoy, the leader of the coup who is to present the Decembrist manifesto to the Senate, is nowhere to be seen. Yeah, they're all dead. So, <laughs> I already told you guys that this already failed at 7, and I should have called it off at that point, but yeah, now it's just... And the members of the Senate have already gone home. Relief leaves to find him. Crowds of spectators begin to gather around Senate Square. The general mood is one of support for the Decembrists. This watercolour was painted by Karl Ivanovich Kolman, an eyewitness, and is considered one of the most realistic depictions of the day. Oh, it's actually interesting. We got people in houses on the left side, we got people surrounding all of them, and then we have the guys in the centre, and we have the cannon going off, it's gonna kill all the Decembers. And again, they didn't inform the people that this was happening, but the people were like, oh yeah, that actually sounds like a rather decent idea, but, you know, we weren't informed that this was happening at all, so, yeah. Around noon, Count Mikhail Miloradovich, Governor General of St. Petersburg and a famous war hero, arrives in the square. He rides straight up to the Moscow Lifeguards Regiment and asks, Who among you was with me at Kulm, Lutzen, and Bautzen? 
recalling the great battles against Napoleon. He tells the men they have been lied to, that Constantine has renounced the throne, and they must swear the oath to Nicholas. In Trubitskoy's absence, Lieutenant Prince Eugen Abelensky becomes de facto leader of the Decembrists in Senate Square. He tells Miloradovich to leave, but the general ignores him. Abelensky tries to prick the general's horse with a bayonet to drive him away, but accidentally stabs the general. Then Pyotr Kachowski steps forward and shoots Miloradovich at point-blank range. The general mortally wounded. The same dude that was supposed to shoot the czar shoots the gen <sighs> general was actually trying to be like, hey guys, I need you to stop and think for a minute, all right? You were with me. Let's just all calm down here because all these men are about to die. Because no one else supporting them. Literally no one. Everyone that was in their revolution little group was like, nah, I'm not doing this. I'm scared. Uh, and he was trying to convince them to be like, hey, I need you to stop. Oh, here we go. It is carried away by his horse. The lifeguards, grenadier regiment, and sailors of the guard declare for the Decembrists. They join the Moscow lifeguards in Senate Square. The Decembrists are gathering a powerful, disciplined force of 3,000 troops in the heart of the Russian capital. But Trubitskoy has still not appeared, and there is little leadership. They stand and wait in the freezing cold, while the Emperor begins to mobilize his own forces. Unbeknownst to the men in Senate Square, Prince Sergei Trubitskoy had given up all hope of success early that morning, as soon as he heard that the Senate had sworn its oath to Nicholas. Possibly suffering some form of breakdown, he wanders around the city, at one point passing by Senate Square itself. His brilliant military record makes such behavior difficult to understand. A Decembrist later recalled, his absence had a decisive influence upon us and the soldiers too, for with few epaulets and no military titles, no one dared take command. So with few epaulets, so epaulets are actually like ranks for officers, well, like shoulder boards kind of for officers. So with few epaulets and no military titles, so literally means that no one there had any experience and they didn't have a lot of rank. No one dared take command because he was absent. And it does kind of make you wonder, I mean, maybe he was given all of his stuff? I mean, he, he quote-unquote earned it, so I don't know, but he just, he just is like, nah. And then, bop, that's it. Rileyev, meanwhile, exhausted and sick, spends the day in a futile search for Trubitskoy, before he is forced to retire to bed. The crowd is now several thousand strong, and their loyalties clearly lie with the Decembrists. Some policemen and patrols are even attacked by civilians. When Emperor Nicholas arrives, he and his entourage are pelted with sticks and stones. But guards units loyal to the government are arriving at Senate Square in force and take up positions surrounding the rebels. I want you to see how many government forces there are. Yeah, no, they have the majority at this point. Soon they outnumber the Decembrists three to one, though not all are willing to fire on their comrades. That does make sense. They're not willing to shoot them. So why would you shoot your own soldiers? Kind of, kind of semi believe in their cause, but you also loyal to the emperor and also, you know, don't want to shoot them. So, in fact, Isaac's bridge is deliberately obstructed by troops of the Finnish lifeguards regiment, whose sympathies lie with the Decembrists. I wonder why. Maybe it's because Finland wanted to be independent and it was taken over and they don't share the same culture. I wonder, wonder why they did that. Others, such as General Orlov, are outraged by the Decembrists' actions. He orders his guards' cavalry to charge the rebels. His men are pelted with stones and timber thrown by the crowd. And the rebels stand firm. Some shots are fired, a few men are hit, and the cavalry withdraw. Several cavalry charges are made that afternoon, with no decisive outcome and just a handful of casualties. Oh, I mean, those cavalry charges are probably made to break them. Um, and it, it, nope, they're, they're standing their ground, so here we go. 
still no Decembrist officer takes charge of the situation. There seems to be no plan at all. It is minus 10 Celsius, and their men have been standing motionless for hours. The commander of the Lifeguards Grenadier Regiment, Colonel Nikolai Stürler, arrives to order his men back to barracks. Kachowski shoots him, inflicting another fatal wound. <laughs> what is this man? I won't shoot the Emperor, but I'll shoot literally everyone else. <laughs> what the hell? The Metropolitan Bishops of St. Petersburg and Kiev approach the troops and tell them it is their Christian duty to swear the oath to Nicholas. But they are mocked and chased away. The Emperor is deeply alarmed by the situation in Senate Square, though many comment on his calm demeanour. He later confides to his younger brother, the most amazing thing about this story is that you and I were not shot. Yeah, probably, yeah. That's what I would be thinking too. I'm like, huh, I'm not dead yet. The short winter day is ending. Nicholas fears that if the standoff continues into the night, the crowds will turn hostile. He now has 32 guns of the Guards' artillery at his disposal. He sends General Sukozanet to tell the rebels to lay down their arms or they will be fired upon. It's a bad choice of emissary. Sukozanet is despised by the troops. They tell him to get lost. Seems like most of the generals, because you know, I've only seen colonels that have, at the highest level of colonels that were supposed to be here on the Decemberist side, didn't even show up. So the Russian Tsar really has all the generals at his side. As dusk falls, the guns are wheeled forward. The first volley is blank rounds. The next is fired over the heads of the rebel troops, but hits several people in the crowd. The troops stand firm. The next volley of grape shot is fired directly into their pack's ranks. I can't imagine the carnage at that close range when they're all packed together like that. Ah, turn into Swiss cheese. Scores go down. Under this murderous fire, the troops break ranks and head out onto the frozen Neva River. Mikhail Bestuzhev tries to organize them for an attack on the Peter and Paul fortress, little more than a thousand meters away across the ice. But as they form up, they come under more artillery fire. Cannonballs smash the ice. Many drown. The rest escape as best they can. After a standoff lasting several hours, the military revolt has been ruthlessly crushed by Russia's new emperor. I mean, that wasn't hard to do. This thing died the morning of everyone decided to not show up. This, this was had literally zero chance of succeeding and everyone that was a part of it that actually went there probably died or was exiled or killed and everyone that didn't led to it. I mean, it's not even like what if something succeeded. It's like, I mean, this is pretty kind of clear and cut. Like this was not gonna happen. The official death toll is just 80. Eyewitnesses claim it is much higher. The Decemberist leaders, who all survived... I... Oh, who all survived? Of course they all did. All right. But, uh, yeah, I would not be surprised if this is way over 80. It's probably near a couple hundred. Five the bloodshed in Senate Square are rounded up and arrested that night and the following day. The Decemberist uprising in St. Petersburg is over. The revolt in the south has yet to begin. Well, there you go. Half measures achieved nothing. We want to clear out the whole house. Pablo Pestel, letter to Nikki. <laughs> this is already over, but yeah, okay.
13th December 1825. Tolchin, Ukraine. The day before the St. Petersburg revolt, Pavel Pestel, leading figure of the Southern Society, is denounced by one of his officers and arrested. The Southern Society's plans for an uprising are thrown into chaos. Sergei Muraviov Apostol. Let's just throw it all up in the air and whoop, one day right before the sepulchral revel. Yeah, this is, all right, cool. Yep, yeah, all right. Takes over as leader. He receives news of the disastrous uprising in St. Petersburg, but decides to go ahead with the planned rising in the south. On the 29th of December, he is arrested himself, but quickly freed by fellow officers. The next day, he... What is this going to accomplish? What is this going to accomplish? Everyone thinks logically for two seconds. Two seconds. There's already been a coup in Moscow, or in St. Petersburg. It has already failed, okay? They have the army at this point. They have their lifeguard regiments. They have everything they need to keep the government running. You are in the southern bit of, of Russia, where it's fertile. That's all that is there. You are going to try to launch a coup against an established government that is not in threat of being cooled in its own capital city who are safe. This is dead on arrival. He leads two companies of the 29th Chernigov Regiment into Vasilkov, where they seize money, weapons, ammunition, and supplies. Three more companies, more than 400 men, join the rebels. The next morning, a revolutionary manifesto, written by Muraviov Apostol and Lieutenant Mikhail bestuzhev ryumin is read out to the troops. In the question and answer form of a religious catechism, the document calls for an uprising to end autocracy, serfdom and conscription. Question. What does our holy law order the Russian people and army to do? Answer to repent of our lengthy servitude and stand against tyranny and wickedness, vowing that in heaven and on earth there shall be only one emperor, Jesus Christ. Now, the, the, them arguing for conscription, like ending its conscription, as I've said earlier, probably the first video or this one, um, conscription, uh, basically you're taken from your family and said, hey, your life is now in the army. Congratulations. You had now serve your army and serve in the army until you die. There was no choice in this matter. <laughs> you did not voluntarily join. Congratulations. So you can see why people were pissed about that. By the 1st of January, Muraviev Apostol leads a force of 17 officers and 1,100 men. He attempts to march on Zhitomir to link up with units of the 8th Infantry Division, whose officers are sympathetic to the Decemberist cause. But his route is blocked by government forces. Oh, really? Then, on the 3rd of January, at Ustimovka, his force is intercepted by troops under General Geismar. Muraviev Apostol hopes the opposing troops will join him. Instead, they open fire with grape shot. Then the hussars charge. A few men are killed, but most quickly surrender. 895 men and six officers are taken prisoner, including Muraviev Apostol, who is badly wounded. If it were me, all officers of this revolt are going to be shot and executed. Without question. I'm pretty sure that's what's going to happen here. The enlisted people probably serve prison sentences, more than likely, or are also shot. But the officers, there is legitimately no way they survive any of this. And they shouldn't if they're leading their men like this. His brother, Hippolyte, and another Decemberist officer, Anastasi Kuzmin, take their own lives to avoid capture. The Decemberist uprising in the south is over. Crushed in just five days. My whole story is in a few words. I love my fatherland passionately. I desired its happiness with zero. Colonel Pavlov Pestel.
In St. Petersburg, the Decembrist leaders are interrogated by Emperor Nicholas in person, before they are sent to the Peter and Paul fortress. The Emperor gives instructions on how each prisoner is to be treated, whether they are to be kept in shackles and treated severely or more gently. He despises them all. Trubitskoy he describes as a repellent example of an ungrateful scoundrel. Nicholas sets up a commission to investigate the plot and its origins. 579 suspects are arrested and subjected to repeated interrogations, long periods of solitary confinement, hunger and cold, or feigned sympathy. Many confess freely, revealing details of secret societies and names of co-conspirators. A few resist defiantly. Colonel Bulatov, who was to have led the attack on the Peter and Paul fortress, is so racked by guilt that he kills himself in his cell. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say on that. There are no trials as such. Five months later, the commission returns its verdicts to the emperor. 290 are acquitted, 289 are guilty, with 121 judged to be the greatest offenders. Which would be treason against the Tsar, so I wonder how this is going to happen. Assuming 121 of them are shot, the ones that are acquitted, I'm assuming were just charged, uh, but they didn't do anything. Um, and, or maybe there were some enlisted guys, and then the guilty obviously were in some way part of it. Don't know how deep they were, uh, but probably also shot. A supreme criminal court is formed to carry out sentencing, according to 11 categories of guilt. Devised by Mikhail Speransky, the man the Decembrists had hoped would lead their new government. Those found guilty of minor crimes are demoted and sent to fight in Russia's long-running war in the Caucasus, along with the regiments that joined the Decembrists. Actually, not a bad idea. I could just send them off to the middle of nowhere to go die. Uh, yeah. 31 of the Decemberists found guilty of the most serious crimes conspiracy, rebellion, desiring the Emperor's death are to be executed by beheading. But Nicholas shows mercy and commutes their sentence to hard labor for life in Siberia. Tell me which one of those you would rather have. I'd probably go with execution, but I mean, yeah, hard life in Siberia, which is basically a death sentence at this point. Like, um, it's not like the gulags in the 30s where you had a half decent chance of surviving out here. There's nothing out here. There's no train tracks. There's nothing. So eh. you could also probably escape too. So, I mean, there's that uh, if you want to take that route. Before they depart, officers are stripped of their rank and noble privileges and ceremonially disgraced. Their greatcoats are burned, their swords snapped in half. This is the punishment handed out to Nikita Muravyov, who drafted the Northern Society's constitution for a new liberal Russia. And to Prince Sergei Trubetskoy, the Decembrists' vanishing leader, whose life is only spared because of his family name. Five Decemberists will not be spared. Pyotr Kachowski, Sergei Muravyov, oh, the man that shot everyone but the Emperor. Oh, yeah. Apostol, Mikhail Bestuzhev Ryumin, Pavel Pestel, and Kondraty Relief. A public death for the chief instigators and conspirators will be their lawful revenge for disturbing the public peace, Nicholas writes to members of the commission. All five are sentenced to death by quartering, a brutal punishment involving public dismemberment. Yeah, yeah, drawn and quartered is as bad as it gets. Uh, ropes are tied around every single limb and you are pulled by horses. I'll leave it there. Brutal death. God and the Sovereign have decided my fate. I must die, and die a shameful death, 
Rilev writes in a final letter to his wife. Pray to God for my soul. The tactics of revolution may be summed up in two words, to dare. If we come to grieve our failure, will serve as a, us will serve as a lesson to those who come after us. Basically, <laughs> make sure your revolution can succeed in the first place. Um, and actually have guys that are actually willing to do their job. So... Thirteenth July, eighteen twenty six. Nicholas commutes the sentence to hanging, but the execution of the five Decemberists by the ramparts of the Peter and Paul fortress is badly botched. As the men are hanged, ropes break, and three men fall to the ground. What a miserable country. They can't even hang us properly. <laughs> remarks one survivor. Spectators appeal for mercy. According to tradition, a man who survives a hanging should be spared. Instead, more rope is found. And the second time, there is no mistake. Oh yeah, they're making sure there's no mistake. These guys are all dead either way. More than 80 Decemberists were eventually sent to Siberia. A few were accompanied by their wives, who voluntarily renounced their own noble privileges to be with their husbands. Conditions in Siberia were not as extreme as might be imagined. Their hard labor was mostly farm work. Wealthy prisoners were sent money from home, which they used to buy supplies. For active young men, boredom was the greatest enemy. They took up hobbies, played chess, painted. These watercolors were painted by Nikolai Bestuzhev, who on the 14th had led the Imperial Guard sailors to Senate Square. Some formed their own academy, sharing their knowledge and going on to teach local children and set up schools. They remained hopeful of a pardon. <laughs> That's not going to happen, but uh, it's actually pretty... I would, hmm, I would not have been as lenient as Tsar as Nicholas was. I'll just put it that way. They would have all been shot. But it's actually not a bad idea. Bad life out in the middle of nowhere in Siberia, which you will have literally no way to have any political power, but yeah. But it proved a 30-year wait. Only in 1856, after the death of Emperor Nicholas, was an amnesty announced for surviving Decemberists. Among them, Prince Sergei Trubetskoy, who returned to Russia and is seen here, photographed in 1857. Wow! The Decemberist uprising seemed to have been a total failure. A wildly optimistic operation, poorly planned, chaotically executed, doomed from the beginning. The loss of life, thoughtless and unnecessary. But the Decemberists had mounted the first organized political revolt in Russian history. Uh, yeah, actually, that's pretty much true, so you gotta give them credit there, at least. As such, their impact would prove far-reaching. The recent conspiracy, wrote the British resident minister in St. Petersburg, failed from want of management and want of a head to direct it, and was too premature to answer any good purpose. But I think the seeds are sown, which one day must produce important consequences. Almost damn near 100 years later, but yeah, there you go. Emperor Nicholas was never interested in reform. The issues of serfdom and a constitution would be around for decades to come. For those who took up the cause of reform, including Russia's liberal intelligentsia, and future revolutionaries, the Decemberists were an inspiring example of action in the face of tyranny.
and also a learning lesson on what not to do. So Lenin, you know, actively, very actively involved in the revolution, probably studied at least in December a little bit and see what went wrong um, with leadership, because it really was just down to leadership at this point. The father of Russian socialism, Alexander Gertsen, was their great champion. He named his political journal Polar Star, after Rilev's own. On the cover of its first edition, the five Decembrist martyrs. In time, the Decembrists' aims, the abolition of serfdom, a constitution, even the overthrow of the Tsar, were achieved. The constitution, <laughs> let's be very frank here, was a joke. But as I said, the abolition of serfdom does happen with a 47-year mortgage. So there you go. You have to pay off for 47 years. Well, the first constitution basically has absolutely no rights for you, but it exists. And then Tsar Nicholas actually advocates in 1917, and then you actually get some reforms start going there. But their brand of 19th century liberalism was soon overtaken by events in Russia. The communists never completely approved of the aristocratic Decembrists. Though in 1925, they did allow Senate Square to be renamed Decembrist Square to mark the 100th anniversary of the Rising. But the Decembrists' place in Russian history remains highly contested to this day. A 2019 Russian blockbuster film was accused of trivializing the Decembrists and their aims. Others called for the film to be shown in schools. While in 2008, the St. Petersburg Square, where the Decembrists made their famous stand, was renamed again, back to Senate Square. That should, yeah, just, that's the government's position on it, at least Vladimir Putin, back to the Senate Square, meaning that uh, what they did was wrong. Oh. The Decembrists continue to serve as a warning to some, an inspiration to others. All that is certain is the Decembrists have not been consigned to history just yet. Thank you to all the Epic History TV Patreon support. <laughs> so I'm going to leave it there. Amazing video by Epic History TV. Please go check out their video. Um, so hope you guys like my reaction to it. Might have come off a little harsh there, but I, I mean, I may seem that way, but I really do think so. I mean... Uh, was doomed when none of the officers decided to show up at that point and then nothing to lead. But I mean, there you go. It's still a legacy um, to at least be proud of that you tried to implement reform in an era where it was basically feudalism. So there you go. So hope you guys liked that reaction. Uh, you can click uh, right over there if you want to see another one of my reactions. Otherwise, I will see people later and have a good rest of your day.